Hi, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well and have been enjoying the panels they've been at today. Uh, so you are personally at operationalizing the talk, how do we actually really support staff? My name is Chantal Jourdet. I am a social worker, a trauma therapist, and the prevention and outreach coordinator at Mount Sinai Beth Israel's Victim Services Program. So for the past eight or nine years, I've been working with survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence. So talking about how we support staff that are engaging with people that have survived many kinds of trauma is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. Also, I feel deeply honored to be in this community with you all today as I actually started my career in supportive housing actually out in Bushwick. Uh, so I'm really grateful to be able to be a part of this conversation with you all. Um, and I guess I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists, but before I get to that, I just want to do a little housekeeping. So I know a lot of you are going to be uh, thinking a lot about the stuff that we're talking about today, and you might have some questions. We're really going to try to hold those questions till the end of the panel. So if you could just do jot down any ideas or thoughts that you have or feedback, we'd really, really appreciate that as we go through this conversation. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm very, very excited to introduce to you the following people. So, to my left, this is Mary Adams. She is a licensed clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience developing and managing programs that serve children, adolescents, and families in New York City. Her experience spans directing residential treatment programs for adolescent girls, managing community-based programs, community-based education programs for youth and young adults in East New York and Bed-Stuy, as well as supervision of supportive housing programs serving young adults and families with histories of mental health issues, poverty, substance abuse, and trauma. Currently, Mary is the Managing Director of Mental Health and Wellness at University Settlement, or The Door, uh, where she oversees the integration of mental health and wellness practices and services throughout programming at the agencies. Next to Mary is Mr. Celso Batista. Uh, Celso started working at Breaking Ground, when it was actually formerly known as Common Ground, uh, as an outreach worker back in 2009. He slowly moved to different positions from outreach worker to case manager to team leader to assistant director of programs and finally to building director almost two years ago. Coming from the program side where he worked on getting chronically street homeless individuals off the streets and into permanent housing, he is now on the opposite side of the same coin in permanent housing where the focus has shifted not only to maintaining clients housed but also to help them integrate into the larger community and in rebuilding their lives. Currently, uh, he is the building director of the Prince George, which provides supportive housing for 415 tenants with special needs, um, as well as those who are low income. And last, but certainly not least, is his partner in crime uh, and advocacy, Mr. Sean Adams, who is the program director of CUCS's the Prince George, as I said, a 415 unit supportive housing program that's located in Midtown Manhattan. He has worked with supportive housing for over 12 years and has been the social services director at the Prince George for over eight years. He has worked in close partnership with Breaking Ground Building Management throughout his tenure at CUCS. And he appreciates that both agencies share the same values of providing a safe and nurturing environment so that their tenants can live as fully and successfully in the community as possible. So a big round of applause for our panelists today. So that being said, I think that even though our title doesn't say it directly, what we really are going to be talking about today is vicarious trauma and how all of us experience vicarious trauma regardless of what histories we come in with. Um, when we're working with people, it's hard to avoid experiencing the weight of the, of the experiences that they have had in their lives and how we tend to navigate that with them and also personally. So today we really want to be talking about how we can look at vicarious trauma from not only this place of the individual, which I think has been the big buzzworthy conversation that we see in a lot of places. It's always trauma-informed care. It's talking about how do we you know, uh, create self-care practices in our own lives. But what we really want to talk about today in this panel is how can we actually look at this from a programmatic level? How do we actually integrate trauma-informed care and self-care as a part of our everyday work life, not just what we do in our personal lives outside of work in order to mitigate the trauma we're interfacing with. So I guess what I'd like to start with actually is what do you guys think you'd want folks to get out of the panel today from your end or your perspective given that framework? 
Yeah, don't scream it into it. I know. <laughs> this is, okay. Hi, everybody. So I think really as Chantal said, and I, I think it's funny, I was thinking that this would be lightly attended because it's the last workshop of the afternoon, but nothing like self-care and vicarious trauma to, to fill a room. Mm. We, we, we've all been doing this for a long time, and I think that, as Chantal alluded to, there's this buzzword of secondary trauma or trauma-informed care. But nonetheless, I don't think that we've operationalized that in our practices. So individual supervision, how does it show up in our staff meetings, in our group um, supervision meetings? And also, how does it show up from the top down organizationally? How do we respond as an organization to a crisis, to a serious incident? How is that leveraged and used to lead and model for all of the employees of an agency on how do we practice self-care strategies? So before you can even talk about these things, I think as a field, and I, and I think today's conversation is an opportunity to rethink some of how we approach our work. I think before we can even talk about self-care, we need to talk about secondary trauma. And again, I think it's a buzzword that we use all the time. And I think that we say it and we use it and we walk away without thinking about it enough. And so a really simple explanation that I think is, is worth not just reading but thinking about is secondary traumatic stress is the emotional duress that results when an individual hears about the firsthand trauma experience of another. Its symptoms mimic those of post-traumatic stress disorder. So we know that post-traumatic PTSD came out of people returning from fighting in wars. And so I think all of us in this room understand that we go into communities that are impacted by poverty, many times generations of poverty, and in fact we are absorbing and witnessing a lot of micro and macro level responses and fallout from trauma. And before we can talk about self-care then, we need to begin to start talking about how do we acknowledge that from our hiring process to our supervision process to our response to simple incidents to more larger serious uh, crises and incidents that happen. And then I think we want to talk a little bit about that today in a concrete way. So I think that we want to get into that deeply. I don't think that we want to offer a quick fix necessarily for anything today, but more to acknowledge that everybody in this room is really a part of work that does expose us to trauma and that once we begin to be less afraid of that and acknowledge that it's really a part of the human experience and it's not us and them, that it's a part of the world, that then we can begin to sort of become part of a healing community. And that helps us, that protects us from the having to fix it or, or the more traditional helper role that we've fallen into. So, so. Sean, do you guys have any thoughts about what you'd like folks to get out of the panel today? Yeah. <clears throat> so on the uh, building side, we um, oversee the facility and the building department. So that entails a lot of our maintenance staff and who are pretty much on the floor on a regular basis, either sweeping or doing the regular housekeeper jobs. And I just wanted to um, look at that from that perspective and start thinking about how to normalize these experiences that they may be seen on a regular basis and having um, conversations around that so that it's open and it's, it's normalized to the point where it's not um, a, a taboo to, per se to speak about this in an open uh, forum, whether it's in supervision or in, um, in, in ma staff management meetings, um, making sure that we are providing the space for everybody to be open to share. Like Mary was saying, that it's, it's something normal, it's part of our human experience that we want to be able to participate in. Um, and with that, be okay with not per se knowing the, the answer. There is no cookie cutter answer that's going to fix the problem. Um, it's, I think it starts with acknowledging that there is this issue and how we can start moving in a, in a direction that's going to just help all of us deal with those situations and also in eventually be able to pass that on to our tenants or clients that we're also dealing with. 
So I work on the social services end. I'm the director of um, a program that's fairly large. We have 416 clients. Um, I have a staff of about 23, and Celso has a staff of about 20. 22, yeah. um, and so I'm very excited that we're having this dialogue today, and actually that the room is as big and as filled as it is, because it shows how important this is. And um, something as panelists I think we were talking about was, how important is it that we have these conversations ongoing to reduce the taboo, but also that normally it doesn't come up, because maybe it feels that it's too messy, or there's no time or we don't know what to do as administrators or staff members with, well, now am I responsible for your, you know, your trauma experience or how to make you feel better and understanding that we may not be able to make the situation better, but at least we can start a dialogue and I'm really hoping that today, as we um, work together as panelists and as a, as a group, to really look at how we can work with this together because it's so prevalent in the work that we do with our staff and our clients every day. Absolutely. So I want to, you know, and I, I think the piggybacking on that is the critical idea that most of us are pulled to this field because of sort of who we are and sometimes our experience, but also because by nature we're more empathic, we're more intuitively pulled to this work, and that's what makes us very good at this work. That's why we're able to engage effectively and really make change and assist people. But the flip side of that coin is that makes us more susceptible to secondary stress. And this is, research shows this, that helping professionals are more vulnerable. So something that we're passionate about and that we're brought to also is something that we're gonna absorb more. So, so beginning to acknowledge that and beginning to really label the trauma that, that we're sort of a part of is, the foundation for us to beginning to say, okay, and so now what do we do about it? Because it's not an option in our career to, or in our profession, to say, yep, and you better get your self-care. Go have a good weekend. Go take a yoga class. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about every single day when I walk into work and I see a homeless person outside, it impacts me different than somebody who's selling shoes across the street. They're really just th thinking about like this year's fashion. It's, they're drawn to the arts. They're drawn to something different. I'm drawn to like humanity and the human condition and fighting poverty. So we carry things differently. And again, this makes us passionate and successful at what we do. But it gives us, this is our starting point and it makes it a non-negotiable that we begin to sort of create these, the, the freedom to talk about trauma and, and how it impacts us and how it shows up in us in our work, and then going a step further and actually setting up the systems, the processes, and getting those things in place that become the norm in our organizations, not the, hey, we're gonna do yoga once a month, right? We're, we're talking about something very different. So no, I think that's great. And actually, you've kind of been covering some of the stuff that was on these slides already. So I've been trying to yeah, skip kind through. Of sit, yeah. yeah, set them up. Um, so on that, on that, like if we were to keep going with that line of thought, and mm -hmm. we actually look at what vicarious trauma or secondary trauma looks like, um, how do you guys see this kind of playing out on a daily basis in your programs, whether that's individual or as a team? And I think it's really important, again, that we kind of shift back and forth between micro and macro here, right? Where we, we're really looking at, we all, I think for the most part, get this idea of what a traumatized individual, like that, what those symptoms might look like, and we should speak to that, right? But also, what does this look like for a program? How does, how does a program maybe act out in a certain way when they're experiencing vicarious trauma on a compounded level? So I don't know, anybody can jump in. I can, I'll start with that. So at the Prince George, we, um, most of our staff are direct care staff, whether they're social workers or case managers. Um, we really run the gamut. We've been open about 14 years, and we have some staff that have been there 14 years, and we have some staff that are brand new, and then we have other staff in between. And you know, over the years, being a program director for a while, I've had the opportunity to see how vicarious trauma really affects people in different ways. Um, as someone said before, it's not cookie cutter. Everybody expresses what they're going through in very different ways and they ask for help in very different ways or they don't ask for help in very different ways. It really depends on the person. And one of the things that I look at is someone who's been there, let's say 14 years as a case manager, um, over the years they've learned through one way or another how to care for themselves, how to recognize when they're feeling traumatized or burnt out, 
And the, the one person I'm thinking about in particular can really articulate that well because she's been in the field for a very long time and has many different supervisors. Someone who's new and starting out into the field, some of the things that we do is in the interview process, we really talk to somebody about what they're gonna see. We're in supportive housing, so we're bearing witness to the unfolding of someone's life in every facet. There's, we see everything, um, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, someone comes in their bathrobe, someone, you know, you see people in the hallway in, in various um, ways. And so um, you learn a lot about them over time. So we really, we're upfront about that in the interview process, and we really want to give someone the opportunity to make a choice whether they want to work in this population or not, because supportive housing in some ways is very unique. And we don't want to sugarcoat it. We also don't want to make it sound worse than it is, but we want to be honest, and we want to give someone a choice. The other thing is, in supervision, we're really asking the question and pausing, taking a time to slow down out of our busy days and ask someone, how are you doing? What's going on for you? And giving them a chance to actually check in and say, oh, I'm actually really fried right now because of blah, blah, blah. But they're, they're so busy, they're running from one thing to another and coming into supervision. So we want to give someone a space to really identify what's going on and bring up points of mindfulness. How do you know when you're feeling burnt out? How do you know when you're starting to feel overwhelmed? Do you feel it in your shoulders? Do your shoulders get tight? Do you not breathe? Do you take it home with you? We're gonna talk a lot about taking it home with you, but, but really helping someone understand that they are taking it home with them and there's a choice. That could be one place to start with that and then for them to bring that into supervision. But I think that giving people permission to ask for help and taking the taboo out of asking for help, because it's not a sign of weakness, it's actually a sign of strength and it's something that we want to normalize with our staff on every, in every opportunity that we get. I think that those are some of the big, big things that we can do, but really giving people the space to at least identify that they're starting to get traumatized or they are traumatized. So, just to jump in on that a little bit, um, there's a lot of elements there that we share from on, on the breaking ground side and the facility uh, management side. Um, one of the big thing is that we do supervision on a regular basis with our staff and we do have our all staff meetings. So we try to give everybody that space in the forum um, to speak about anything that they may be affecting, being affected by. Uh, but it's not per se it's something that's, let's say, systematic enough at this point where we're intentionally asking, have you experienced any kind of trauma by, in dealing with any situations or, or, or tenants? But we do want to keep it open so that because of what Sean said, everybody deals with trauma and has different types of coping mechanisms, we want to give them the space to either talk about it at that moment or think about it and come back and speak about it at another um, supervision session that we may have or a different staff, all staff meeting, or even just on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, on the building side, we, we do have a range of, um, of different of experiences as well. Uh, because we've been open since 1999, we have some staff members like Sean on CUCS as well um, that have been there since pretty much the beginning, so 15, 16 years, and they've also have developed um, their own ways of coping um, with different traumatic events that they may, um, may have faced. Um, so they, uh, they would have um, answers to some of the questions and how to deal with certain things that some of the newer staff uh, may also be trying to um, to figure out for themselves is when they're coming into an environment such as supportive housing. Um, we also, in the interview process, do the same thing and making sure we lay out what are possible scenarios that they may be facing with on a regular basis so that um, it's not a surprise for them when, you know, if they get hired, um, they see somebody running down the hallway screaming or on some kind of um, substance that it's not something that they are um, sorry, that they're not um, um, ready for at that moment. Um, and then it's, it's after that, um, you know, how do, how do you debrief from that and, and talk about it so that um, it's not something where they're not, they're not, they don't have the space to really talk about these issues that they may be af being affected by. Um, so from whether it's the housekeeper, the engineers, the super, we have the uh, facility directors and the, the security directors, so we have security on site as well, and they're all at any point dealing with a situation. So um, not that it's happening on, a, on every single time of the, you know, of the day, but there are, um, from our perspective, you know, maybe two major ways where um, a staff member can experience some type, type of traumatic event with the tenant, whether it's some, uh, a major incident or some just talking about um, to the tenant because they become friendly with a tenant mm -hmm. at certain times and develop relationships and the tenant may decide to share something with them. 
Um, so we, we encourage the staff to share forward, in a sense, that kind of information to their supervisors and with uh, CUCS and the caseworkers so that we know how to best address any issues that may come up with that specific tenant. Um, and then you have um, any, uh, you know, potentially any kind of type of incident that where we have certain protocols in place that we, we rely heavily on so that everybody knows um, at any given time that there are people ready to respond, that there's something that the staff needs to bear, uh, be aware of at, a moment, at any moment's uh, given time. Um, so it's important that we, during the interview process as well as throughout the, after hiring, throughout uh, supervision, we visit um, any incidents just to make sure that we, we take that as a, as a learning tool and teaching tool um, and ensure that we're looking over the protocol, what could we learn from certain incidents and how we can apply um, situations in a different way that may help the next time something like this comes up. Comes up so. Go ahead. You know, I'm listening to Soso speak and I'm thinking, right, and the, and the key is, is that all of us should be sitting in this room and and thinking, and we have to keep learning, right? We have to keep doing this better. We have to keep figuring out how do we take care of ourselves? How do we take, take care of our programs, our staff? You know, we have a formal debriefing process that we instituted agency-wide, and I'm at two organizations, but there's a parent organization, and we use it in a variety of different settings. But I was talking to Chantel about a debriefing that I did recently with a team that's exposed to some pretty intensive crisis-oriented stuff, and that the debriefing was really intense. It hadn't been, it had, it had been, I, it was some kind of, you know, sort of very serious altercation that got very scary, and staff were really shaken by it. But it was very clear that when we did the debriefing that these people were on edge, that they were already at their max, and that many of them were at a breaking point. And I knew it because they were talking about sort of um, you know, I felt like I felt like hitting the person. This was a staff, a very solid, very good staff. There was somebody, you know, people were openly crying. Immediately, I went to leadership and said, there's a problem. We need to step in. We need to assist them. And these were all strong, heavy-hitting players, like really our good, strong staff. It was clear they had had one crisis after another in this setting. And so it's an opportunity for, for leadership or for program directors to step in and say, okay, we need to step in and then what is our strategy? And in this case, we actually put in some additional staff. The message to the staff that, got, that did the debriefing was, oh boy, we, we heard you, we saw you, we know this is not your typical game, and we're going to respond with the idea that if we have to shift staffing in the future, we will look at that. So there's, there's many, many payoffs from that kind of operationalizing a debriefing response. One, we debriefed, so they got to sort of get some of that steam out. Two, staff see that it's acknowledged and that it's responded to, even if it isn't, you know, somebody dying or some terrible thing, it was something that shook staff, so it, we responded to it. And three was, when it, when it was different, upper level management stepped in and said, okay, we will make a change, we will respond. So the win-win-win is that your staff feel heard and supported. They understand that there is, there are people seeing this and responding, and of course it helps to stabilize program. And in fact, it did do that. But so this is to say that although we have operationalized different processes at University of the Door, we're constantly still looking at ourselves and still learning and still taking in the input from our staff. Because what it looks like, as Chantel was asking, is when people are burning out, they're responding impulsively, they're snapping at clients, they're showing up late, they're disgruntled, they're hopeless. And it's usually about the agency. Oh, these people suck, they don't do, you know, so that kind of disgruntles is often, we've all heard it, we've all heard it. And so, it's, yeah, and, and so this is, and so when we hear that, we as managers or as program directors or as coworkers can also then burn out and say, ugh, oh, you know, they're at it again, as opposed to, do we need to step back and say, have we addressed what's happening in our programs? Again, I don't know that we've paid attention to this as a, as a profession. And the evidence says that we are more vulnerable to feeling this. So it becomes this non-negotiable. 
to build it. And I mean, you guys are sort of the, the, the superpower example yeah. because it's property management and social service partnering together. And that's a little bit of a challenge in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this is our opportunity to say, okay, so have we done this well enough? And how are we operationalizing self-care in a way that, that's, translating, that's transferring out into all of our work that's really integrated into everything that we do because it's not the one crisis incident. It is not, oh, something bad happened on the fifth floor last night and we all have to get together and talk about it. It's sort of every single day dealing with the impact of poverty, but we really get, we really know that. We understand that and it's sort of heart-wrenching, but if we have systems built into support so that we can just feel terrible about it sometimes, it gives us that, that energy, right? To go out and be very present and very intentional. Sorry. No, I think that's fantastic. And I think it's really great to bring up this idea of, you know, by moving into looking at, again, and I know I keep harping on this, but moving into looking at from a systemic level or from yeah. like a programmatic level, you know, oftentimes in working with survivors of violence, one of the number one things that we talk about is victim blaming, right? And when we talk about self-care and vicarious trauma, oftentimes we place that on the individual worker and say, well, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Or why haven't you done, have, why haven't you gone to therapy or yoga or done all of these things to take care of yourself and your problem of being traumatized by this work because obviously that's your issue and so it's to, uh, for us to think critically about how we as programs other our own staff who are inevitably experiencing trauma in the field that they're in and so when we move that conversation to operationalizing this when we move it into talking about self-care as a programmatic conversation rather than an individual conversation we allow for the flexibility of that victim blaming to be one eradicated but we also are taking a community and collective accountability for each other and for the work that we're doing and in turn we are then modeling for our for our uh, constituents or our tenants corrective and healing ways of working through or managing or navigating through difficult times in our lives whether that's big T trauma or little T trauma right so I guess you know you were talking about this one um, agency that you went in and did this debriefing with but I'm curious and and this is across the board for either any of you guys to shout in on but what do you guys see as being, because in that situation, that sounds like kind of a miracle scenario. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be real. I, I, I walk into a scenario and I constantly engaging with agencies or even sometimes in my own program where when you are a program that's built on a crisis intervention model, right, you're moving from crisis to crisis to crisis and that's, you're surviving. But what is surviving versus living, right? So my question to you is, is like, what are the barriers to living that we see in our workplaces? So... Um, I could start off with this. Celso and I kind of both share this. I've been um, at the Prince George a little bit longer. But um, back in January, we uh, went through a period where we were, we've been open 14 years and a lot of our clients are original tenants. They moved in 14 years ago, mostly in their 50s. So now they're between 65 and 70 and they're starting to pass away. Mm -hmm. And so we had a period over three months where we lost seven, eight clients and these were clients that were well known within our building. I mean, we have a very large building, but these were clients that I've known for years. These are clients that a lot of our staff have known for years. A lot of Celso staff have known for years. And we, it was like one after the next, after the next. And I think one of the hardest things, especially as an administrator, as a director, is that we have no control over these things, right? We're, we're in these buildings. We had one gentleman um, who I had known very well. He had a heart attack in the elevator. Um, and staff responded instantaneously, and he was worked on for quite a while in the lobby. And a lot of our tenants saw it, a lot of our staff saw it. It was unbelievably painful to watch. And um, here I am, I'm the director, and what do I do, right? Like, what can I do? This is terrible, I'm affected. Um, and my staff are affected, and there's, I know going into, into a debriefing session, there's nothing that I'm gonna say that's gonna make this any better. But it doesn't mean that we avoid those conversations that are painful, could be very messy. I could cry in front of my staff, and I did, mm -hmm. but, um, and I have at times. And, and the thing is, like, I think that that's so important. I mean, it's being authentic, it's being vulnerable, and it's, it's modeling to your staff that it's okay to be vulnerable, and it's okay to ask for help, and it's okay to not have the answers, because when they work with their clients, we want to be true, right, with our clients. We want to be authentic. And we don't want to say that we have a solution to something we don't, and we also don't want to put the expectation out there that our staff are going to be able to resolve something that's been long standing for decades for a client. 
So we want to give them permission to be able to struggle with these things. We want to give them the support that they need to do that. And sometimes that's just to be present. Um, it's just to be with people in conversation about what they're experiencing and know that, they're, that it's seen, it's witnessed, and that we'll continue the conversation. It's not a one and done situation ever in our work. It's really about having these ongoing conversations um, and just being as, as willing to have those conversations when we need to and open to and looking for them when we need to, when someone's angry, when someone's not being themselves, and they may not even know that they're acting something out. And doing that without blame, just with noticing, I think, and without judgment, can really be um, instrumental in helping someone feel better. sure that I give each of you time to kind of talk to the ways that like we again moving from this like micro person to person intervention of recognizing how do we truly see people and bear witness to them and our staff so that we can then give them the courage to show up and bear witness for our tenants in our community right um, so I want to make sure that I'm giving each of you time to really talk about what that looks like on a programmatic level um, Mary did you want to start and we can go through your PowerPoint and then we can kind of just go down the line does that sound good to you guys or yeah, that's like? fine. I don't. Okay. I, I, not Do you sure. want to use it? Or? I don't know if we need to use okay. the PowerPoint. I think you know. I had a very interesting experience having spent you know years and years in this field. When I joined University of the Door, one of my first charges was to figure out how to respond to crisis. And so there had been um, a very serious crisis before I started. It was one of our community-based programs. It wasn't one of our housing programs. And a young person had been killed. And you know they had like done what they could. You know, sent social workers out to you know support people. And that really flopped. Right? There was no real plan. Nobody knew the social workers. They, the social workers didn't know the community. Um, and so, in fact, we did. Um, you know, I did did a lot of research on crisis debriefing and came up with a model that could be, that, that would meet our, our needs and our population. And through that, we, we instituted a formal response that we actually didn't need in the moment because there was no crisis. And so it gave us an opportunity to roll this out to everybody in the entire organization and say, when there is a crisis, this is what will happen. And that crisis could be, you know, Sandy, 9-11, somebody in our, one of our programs being hurt or killed. And it gave us very proactively this opportunity to say, here's what the executive director has said they value and what they want to do for your teams. So when something goes bad, don't worry. We are going to send in a, profession, a, a trained team from people in-house, but not from your team. You don't need to be de debriefing your staff when there's a crisis. And the process in and of itself, and, and it's, it's going to be handed out in, in a packet, is generally a two or a two and a half hour debriefing process. And it walks you through the idea that you have a crisis and you go in and you make sure that everything is sort of taken care of, the, if the window is broken, if somebody is hurt. But about you know 48 hours, 72 hours later, you really get everybody together. And you do a formal debriefing process. And you can see different models of this, crisis and incident debriefing. We retrofitted this for our needs, for our populations that we work with. But it allows every single staff to go through certain steps. And you know, you know, you invite people. They don't have to come, but you really encourage people to come. Everybody is asked a series of questions in a very safe environment, and that's, that's qualified before you start, that all bets are off. None of this leaves this room. Very, very healing process, and it's for very serious situations and can be used to whatever falls into the very serious situation. And then you should really end with food and like hand out your phone number in case somebody wants to follow up with more serious, you know, talk through the, 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 the trauma or some, some feelings there happening. But you know, it does a lot for your staff, for agency morale. What it also gave us was sort of a roadmap for dealing with any bad situation. And so what I've found is taking the crisis debriefing model, which is very formal, and two, two and a half hours, and you have to build in and generally have food, is using parts of that to take into staff meetings. So that maybe there's certain questions you ritualize into your staff meetings every week. Because as we know, it's not just the crisis. It's every single day in our jobs. 
and individual supervision, sort of bringing similar questions, ritual questions about what's going on with you. And again, I think a lot of us do this, but not systematically. We're not systematically asking questions about our employees. We're not giving them permission to talk about sort of their own stuff. And there's, there's real, <laughs> You know, when you're formally trained as a social worker, maybe in my day, which was quite a while ago, you were really ta you know, taught to keep yourself on the side. Well, actually, no, we would be very ineffective if we kept ourselves locked behind a closed door. The, the reason why we're pulled into this field is because we're empathic, because we want to make change, because we're good at it. That means we bring our whole selves. And most of us bring you, you know, most of us have our own experiences of, of, of loss, of trauma. And so, right, we don't need to be spilling our heart out, but being able to genuinely connect is a, is a critical element of being able to be effective in our work. And I think Soso spoke about this with his maintenance staff that are working in these buildings. They're oftentimes the most effective staff you have working with clients. The clients connect with them. They're very genuine. They, they get to what the real issues are. And there can be, this is foundational therapy. You don't need to be a psychiatrist. You need to be able to connect genuinely. So, so the idea of self-care and bringing these practices in that, that, that let out a little steam for all of us actually strengthen us as workers because we become less and less afraid of what control it has on us. What becomes our job as leaders, as program directors, or as workers, direct line, we have to sort of bring it up, or executive directors, is to begin to make these systems and say, now we build in time all the time for our staff to debrief after serious incidents. Um, people are allowed to cry in those. You know, if, 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 you, if, if you do it right, people do cry. So this then breaks down a lot of barriers about who we are and what we bring to the work. And it, it really says to us it's okay to be um, different in how we do our work. Mm. It's, it's okay to, it's a very sort of courageous, risky place to be. So you're not blurring boundaries and coming in and, and crying about your life as much as you're able to empathically really connect and, and be in the moment. And I gave an example to Chantel the mm. other day I was with, it was sort of a crisis intervention. I had n never really met this young woman before. She was, you know, having a, just a really rough time. And at one point, she just reached out and grabbed my hands and really cried. And, you know, the books in the old days would say that just that's just not what you do. And I have to say that it was the right thing to do. And it was so powerful. Um, she really just needed. It was like, I thought it was courageous on her part. So this is, we need to sort of get into a place where we're supervising for people to be able to be a little bit in a gray zone, which is very, very risky and courageous for us. We need to operationalize that in our individual supervision through some questions, in our staff meetings, in our group supervisions. We need to very intentionally debrief serious, less serious and more serious incidents. Um, and I probably over-talked my time, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, thinking back a little bit on what Mary was saying, um, we rely a lot, because we're not um, clinical staff, um, mm -hmm. as property managers, we rely a lot, a lot on protocol and procedures. Um, it starts with, like I mentioned earlier, with the interview process and making sure they're aware of what they're getting into. Um, and then a lot after that process going over through with supervision and all staff meeting. But the thing that really stands out a lot in the management um, aspect of things is what procedures do we have in place that are going to help us deal with a situation that may be happening in the building. Um, a lot of it comes down to communication with the housekeeper who are most of the times the first ones to respond to a situation because they are on the floors, uh, whether they're cleaning or doing maintenance work or repairing something in one of the uh, apartments, we have to emphasize with them over and over again that it is crucial for them to communicate with their supervisor and with CUCS and with management as a whole. We all carry walkie-talkies around in the building, so we all know that, um, that this is the main source of, uh, for us to communicate if there is an event happening. Um, we also have something called a panic alarm that um, we all have in our office spaces in case there is something going on in one of the spaces in, um, throughout the building. So when we have that protocol um, and procedure in place and we can 
emphasize that with, this, with the staff. We know that not one staff is responsible solely for whatever is happening. We, they, everybody has their role and their place in responding to something specific and then they can go ahead and pass it on to the next person, whether it's their supervisor or the, the clinical uh, coordinator um, or the CUCS staff. Um, with that, it's important to emphasize the fact that that they're, they're part of the larger community. They're part of the larger group that is, that we're all responding to this together. We're all experiencing whatever situation it is at the same time, um, and we're all responding to it in different, from different angles, different perspective. Um, when there is an event such as a tenant death, we have a protocol in place where it will be management who most likely will be the one going into the apartment and finding the, the deceased person there. And, and from there on, we are able to work together with CUCS, and, and they're the ones making the call to 911, reporting the situation, and then uh, making sure that we're all part of it together so that when the time comes to debrief the day after with the rest of the staff, we're all on the same page as to what happened and who was aware, who was there, um, so that we're all uh, technically on the same page about uh, how to do, um, in terms of dealing with these situations in, in the building side. And I just would like to interject, I think that's so powerful because I think oftentimes, at least in my experience um, in the work that I have been doing and in the past, is there's often this like rigid line between um, staffs, right? Like, and we relegate this idea of like emotional experiencing to clinical staff or to the social workers, right? And we don't, again, like we were saying earlier, we don't allow this other space where we can actually really acknowledge the clinical expertise, I'm gonna actually use that phrase, of a lot of our property and management right. staff, mm -hmm. right? And that they have a lot of these skills because of their own narratives, their own experiences that they're bringing into the space, the, the community that they've been a part of. They might've even been a part of this community prior to working there, right? Um, and I think this idea of being able to integrate across staffs is so important because then it shows that you value everything that every person is bringing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it creates a structure around anticipatory coping. When people know that there's something that they yeah. can do mm -hmm. in response to a situation, they're able to have, like there's choice there, mm -hmm. right? When we strip people of choice, we then are creating trauma and we're, or we're compounding trauma that's already in existence. So I think that was a really great point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think um, Chantel and, and Celso um, and Mary said this very well. I think um, we want to provide our staff and our clients with as much choice as possible. Um, when, we, when we think that someone has passed away in their apartment, um, we'll do something called swipe checks. We have turnstiles in our building. They, people swipe in and out, staff and clients as well. Um, we'll do video camera checks, and then we'll pretty much know what we're um, going to be experiencing, and so usually Celso and I will gather each other <laughs> and um, some other building staff, and we'll be the ones who go in. Um, we don't force anyone to do that, um, and if there's anything else that we think that could be traumatizing for someone, we want to prepare them as much as we can. We want to prepare ourselves, and then we'll debrief together. You know, we really try to utilize one another, just not um, as directors, but as staff. Assistant directors go to assistant directors between breaking ground and CUCS. Direct care staff and other staff will, will support each other as well. Um, but we really want to make sure that we're prepared for what we're going, we're going to experience without mm -hmm. throwing ourselves out in there in an impulsive way. Um, and then we're going to prepare ourselves to then provide support to our clients who may have known the person who is deceased or to whatever other incident might have happened. We want to debrief first ourselves so we can be prepared to provide support to the tenants who are going to need it. They're going to need us to be present. And if someone, if a staff member doesn't feel prepared because they're too triggered by something that might be very close to home mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. we're not going to force them into that situation. Someone else is going to jump in. And we really, really um, pride ourselves on making sure that we are um, reinforcing community both amongst our staff and our clients as much as possible because it's really, you know, it takes a village and mm -hmm. we know that and we don't expect anyone to be a superhero to take things on by themselves and be strong and just, you know, fight through it. It's really not the message that we want to be sending to our staff or to our clients. You know, I think as I listen, I really think of this core principle and you talk about, or I talk about, you know, we're empathic and so we, we get pulled into this, but how do we have these um, 
appropriate emotional boundaries. How do we do that? And, and I think Sean is saying, right, we check in and make sure that it's okay to go into that apartment. You know, they're really, they're really checking in with each other as good coworkers saying, are you okay with this? Am I okay with this? Which is a check-in. But you know what, a core principle, and I talk about this with staff a lot, is the idea that, and Sean alluded to this earlier, we are not fixers. We do not need to fix. Most of the people that we work with in supported housing are superheroes by many, many accounts. They have long since survived lots and lots of challenges. And so when I talk to staff about making decisions and interacting with, with um, clients, it's less about trying to fix, and this takes a burden off staff. It's really just being very present and being with them. We're really, it's not so much, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the discussion of community. When we're in this work and we're really effective, it is more we're all one community. When you've worked in supported housing, as people have said, and they're all coming down in their pajamas, babies are running around in their diapers, it's like, yep, we're all one big family here. <laughs> you know, there's, there, you, you know people in very intimate relationships, and so the idea is, is not that we have to save and fix, and that's very old school helper, right? In fact, it's really that we're partners and we're collaborators with them. Bad things happen to everybody, us included, and that as partners and as community members, we're in it with you, and we're respecting what your decisions are, even when we might not think they're the best decisions, and we're gonna be in it when you come back, and there's fallout from that decision. So this is the different kind of balance for us that's important when we think about self-care, because otherwise we would go home and cry every single night in the shower. Instead, it's we're in the game. We're working with people to be self-directed. Most of them don't need us to fix. They need us to hear their stories and to be able to take in enough of it to help them and not too much of it so that they're overflowing or that it's hurting us. And we need coworkers saying to us, are you okay with this? Or we need to be able to go to our coworkers and say, that's one thing I can't deal with, right? So again, being really, really paying attention to ourselves. As organizations, we wanna build in the systems to make sure we're asking those questions. As individual staff, we wanna teach our individual staff to say, yep, one thing I can't do is the IPV, or one thing I can't do is women's substance abuse, or whatever it is, and then beginning to work through that with a good supervisor. But this is, we are not fixers. We are, you know, the old school helper that we had to save is gone. We're partners, and most of these people are very, very strong and need us to be their collaborators. And that's much more freeing when I say to staff, you don't need to make this decision for them. So I want to ask actually some to kind of shift the conversation to some more kind of like maybe practical tools for those mm. who are supervisors or administrators in the audience. Um, you know, I think it takes, as we mentioned already, it takes a lot of bravery for, again, going back to this idea of living in a culture in which we are supposed to just be able to take it and take it and take it, those of us who are working in this field, um, and without any kind of aftermath. So for those supervisors who are here, what are some ways that they can support a, 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 a you know a case manager or a staff member who's you know uh, who's coming forward and saying this isn't okay this I'm I'm struggling with this what are some really concrete ways that a supervisor could maybe really provide support to that staff member and then what can the community do as well that's open to any of you guys okay. mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean I, I think one of the things that we really try to in, in reinforce with our staff and with our clients is just really starting off with the question of how can I be helpful right now? What do you need? What do you think you need? What what would be helpful for us to, to talk about? Um, because in a lot of ways, um, our clients are experts on what they need, and our staff are experts on what they need. Mm -hmm. We don't want to really try to create a one size fits all, or even just jump jump right into solutions. We really right. want to to really talk about the experience and, and what's going on. And I think you know, in the experience of supervising clinical supervisors over the years. One of the things that a lot of folks have said to me is, where is the line? Where is the line between becoming your staff member's therapist mm. and providing support and supervision? What's appropriate and what's not appropriate? And again, I don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all or that it's concrete, but I think that the thing is, is that you really want to work with someone about how they're experiencing what they've been through in the moment. What's coming up for them? Are they, are they having 
um, just aversion to, to coming to work in the morning? Are they feeling so tired and burnt out they can't make it to work? Are they calling out, like, really what's going on? If they are calling out and they're, they're spending a day at home, is it helping? Is it not helping? Are they the same they are today versus the, the way that they will be next week? Um, and brainstorming ways that they can feel supported and able to work through it at work. The thing is, is that if someone, if this is a long-standing issue, mm -hmm. we might want to, you know, advise them of the EAP program, and from the EAP program, maybe they'll be referred to, to therapy, to also not shaming them for saying that they may need therapy, but also then clarifying what's appropriate in supervision and what's not, and negotiating that. You don't want to get too much into someone's personal life, but you also want to be able to help them and understand them and what their needs are. So I think that people tend to just shy away from the entire conversation, and I think that it is important to not try to play your staff's therapist while at the same time trying to f help them figure out what they need and why they need it and where they can go for that. Um, we, we have a large agency, so we can refer folks to HR for EAP programs and so forth. In smaller agencies, you may have to do some of that work with them, um, but really trying to negotiate what's appropriate and what's not based on what the staff's needs are in that moment. Um, I, I think that you know we really want to take away the taboo from that, and I think we really want to be present. And I think really what we, we keep saying is being present to someone's experience and validating them can be very, very impactful for them. And I think another thing to, to note, as you were saying that as well, um, is is the idea that like like just to reiterate that one size doesn't fit all, and also the idea of like if we're preemptively creating spaces in which we're cultivating structure that allows for people to disclose what's really happening to them, right? Like we're allowing people, our staff to be authentic in spaces with us, then also being able to allow them to authentically heal on their terms and what that might look like. So that HR might be an option, but also that maybe it doesn't need to go, I don't know that HR, going to HR isn't a bad thing at all, but mm -hmm. like to having that be one option, but that like just kind of holding an, an individual staff member accountable to creating and cultivating what they're healing. Mm -hmm. And I use that word, mm -hmm. you know, not in, a, not in a concrete way, but in a, you know, in a way that's kind of flowing and ebbs, ebbs and flows for many of us <laughs> over the years. But like, what does their healing look like? And how do, you know, creating a plan with your staff member so that you can actually check in with them. You can actually say, how has this, you know, you said that you mm -hmm. committed to doing this such and such thing in order to help you address what you've been struggling with. How can I support you in that? How has that been going? Showing up and holding them accountable to that is also, I think, a huge piece mm -hmm. to that supervisory role, right? So it's not just saying, um, here's, here's this help and connecting them to that, but actually helping them cultivate that as a practice in their day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think as supervisors that, that we are obligated to to make time for this, to build it in, to educate and say, nope, secondary trauma is a norm and you should expect it. Um, teaching people to like recognize the signs in themselves, you're just more forgetful, you're later than you used to be, like that's okay, but is this a response to, you know, these all, all the stuff that's been going on here, so really pointing that out. Um, I, I think <coughs> that like, helping people to find ways to boost resiliency. So resiliency is something that can be learned. Like some people are just naturally more resilient than others, but it's one of these things that, that we can grow and we can nurture like a muscle in us. And that's when you find yourself too hopeless, sort of veering towards the burnout stage. You, you wanna begin to start figuring out ways to build resiliency in, in your life. And I. I wish I had brought it for this group. I have a handout that's the 10 ways to build resiliency and it's great for our field. Um, it, it's things like um, recognize that there's always hope. The idea that we don't have to save and fix everything. Um, being hopeful about the future, looking for, uh, you know, um, ways to find humor, in, in your work and in your daily life. And it's a, it's a fantastic list, but this is something that we are almost responsible for as supervisors, is guiding our staff towards what's happening that you're getting so bogged down and you're burned out, and what are ways to um, defy that? And, and is, it, is it like making sure that you're taking breaks, 10 minute breaks from your desk every day? Is it, um, 
doing doing luncheons with with your staff where there's a rule of no talking about work so that you can do like everybody it's potluck and it's 45 minutes and there's no work discussion where's everybody going on vacation what did everybody do friday night you building in practices that models for our staff and reminds us that this work is really valuable and enjoyable like and is pretty humorous half the time right there's a lot to laugh at in our world <laughs> so and i and i also think like at the end of debriefing we'll always do a prideful moment and i've been in some debriefings where everybody has cried um and and ending with i had a powerful moment this week when is really really another resiliency tr tactic because we all have way more good experiences than bad in our work. So it's, it's bringing those practices in. Um, I just want to leave it open to you guys if you have any like last statements or things that you would like, takeaways that you would like the audience to have. Um, before we get into that, I also want to just let you all know that I think tables in the back, Sydney, yes that there are handouts in the back. Mary uh, Shannon's also actually provided some actual in individual tools that you guys can look at around self-care, around developing a self-care plan, around identifying your stress currently in your, uh, you know, in your life and in your work life. These are great tools to do as like, just like staff, to do as a part of staff debriefing. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just some like examples of protocol and policy that have been implemented at the Prince George uh, that have been super helpful in helping you guys create a a really connected staff because I think the number one thing with trauma that we know is that trauma disconnects us healing from trauma is where we come together and we connect um, so yeah just any last takeaways and then we can open up for questions um, I think one thing that um, Celso and I and our tenant services we have um, a tenant services department at the Prince George where there's three staff members that are specifically tasked with creating events um, positive interactive experiences um, amongst staff and tenants on site. There's pretty much something to do every day. And one of the best things that I think that we do um, is something called the Good Neighbor Awards, where tenants can nominate one another for positive acts. And it's one of the most uplifting things that I think that we do at, as a site, because tenants can nominate one another. And there's a little, on the nomination form, there's a little text box where people can put in what, what the person did. And it's read aloud in our multi-purpose room where we celebrate the positive things that our neighbors are doing for one another. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a reminder of how important community is and how impactful it can be for each other. I mean, we have tenants who've lived there a long time who will say, you know, they'll come into our office and they'll say, I don't think that, you know, so-and-so in apartment 235 is doing very well. I noticed blah, blah, blah happened last night and we'll follow up with them. And really, I mean, those are, those are the on the ground things that happen overnight when, when staff, it's just security at night. Um, and we can really intervene, and it, it's just so positive and, and impactful and, and helpful because we cannot do everything ourselves. Um, and it also disempowers our clients when, like, we're the ones who are going to be the ones who are going to intervene all the time. It really is powerful when we're acknowledging what's going on within the building that's, you know, amongst the, the clients themselves. So um, we do that. And one of the other things we do at every event is really try to reinforce the, the importance of community. And so when something does happen that's upsetting, hopefully the community will come together instead of being like separated in their apartments and isolated, where there, then we'll see more impacts of something negative. Um, people will come together, we'll have um, open dialogues about it in our multi-purpose room, and we'll really try to even have like hot topics about what's going on in politics or in the mm -hmm. larger right. world, in the right. more macro level, mm -hmm. and address them without sweeping them under the rug and pretending like they're not happening. And I think that there's a lot of proactive ways we can go about mitigating trauma before it becomes something that, that really impacts an entire community or a whole staff or et cetera. All right, so just to kind of piggyback a little bit on that, uh, I feel like a, a perfect example of the community um, element that we try to implement at the Prince George, it is pre precisely when somebody passes away. Um, we, we do have a memorial service that's, that's um, put up a um, couple of weeks after where all the tenants and the staff are invited to come um, and just share their experiences with either that tenants or any specific um, incidents that they have, may have happened um, just to give everybody that chance in that moment to express um, their grief and their trauma of losing mm -hmm. Potentially a, a somebody that they were working with, or uh, a close friend of them of theirs in from the building, 
Um, so that, to me, kind of like shows how much of a importance of a community, that element of community, um, it, we need to keep on emphasizing because it's it is what we all are. 415 tenants plus about 50 staff members like we're there day in and day out we are interacting with each other in a very human way yeah. um, that's like the, the very basic elements and we're affected by each other whether we want to be or not it's going to happen um, so keeping that in mind is always I feel like the first step and then being open to, to sharing it and and being okay with whatever we are feeling and expressing that um, that from what uh, we're talking about here, it's like the, the first step in um, dealing with trauma and moving forward with that. Mary, did you have any last thoughts? Or you good on that? Okay. So, so I think uh, something that I'm really struck by uh, is that a lot of the things that were shared today in this panel are things that a lot of you are already doing. Mm -hmm. A lot of you have already been developing protocol. A lot of you are having these community events. But what we'd like you to walk away from this with is a sense of intentionality around those acts, right? When you are debriefing, when you are showing up and bearing witness to your staff and to your community in these buildings, that you're thinking critically about how all of these steps are things that mitigate trauma in our spaces. They are all things that help us move through trauma in a less mm -hmm. uh, impacting way, right? Or, that, or just acknowledging that it does impact us and that that's a normal thing. Um, and so I hope that, like, for at least for me, my hope and my intention is that for you all to walk away from the expertise that was here at the table and really try to carry that with you, that intentionality of when I show up in this way, I am actually impacting my community towards being able to work through trauma in a productive way and in a preventative way. Um, so those are my thoughts about that. So thank you guys. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Does anybody have any? I see a hand way in, way back there. Okay, so just to, I, I'm told I should officially repeat questions for clarity. Uh, so, so the idea is, is there a mechanism? Are there ways to develop mechanisms to put in place to help those workers that might be responding to a crisis or to a traumatic event in that in the immediate aftermath of that? Is there a way of taking care of them that can be put in place into supportive housing systems? Does that? Or have you guys experienced that, or do you know? Yes. So from an HR perspective, like policy around it. Okay. So policy around taking care of those workers that may have experienced a traumatic event with a tenant or another worker um, in the immediate aftermath of that. Uh, I um, we don't have a policy per se. Um, we very much do ask people what they need in that moment. So. I've had experiences where there's been something traumatic that's happened and staff actually want to stay with their coworkers because they feel that the only people that are gonna understand are their coworkers. And I say to them, like, if you, if you wanna sit here and stare at your computer for a while and hang out with staff, and we'll spend a good amount of time, like, let, we have three teams in our building, so we'll, if something happens on a team, the whole team will get together, we'll debrief together, we might debrief as a whole staff, but really it's about when someone's ready and what they need in the moment. Um, as far as going home or staying, we work it out. Like, I'm not gonna penalize someone who has just experienced something very horrible. Um, that's like the last thought. We'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. I'll tell my supervisor, we'll figure out a plan. That's not the first thing that we, we really look at. We look at the person and what they need and try to be as respectful and accommodating as possible. I think you're actually highlighting, and, um, well, this question actually highlights what does this mean for us on a macro level, mm -hmm. systemic level, to actually think about creating right. this individualized response, right? Instead of right. having a one size fit all, right? Where the idea of like, oh, of course this person's gonna wanna go home. Obviously, on, I, honestly, in my own work, it's very similar. We don't, we don't wanna go home. We wanna be with the people that know what it's like to be in this space, even if we're not able to work or engage with other people around us. Just being in, in that environment can be very grounding for some of us who've experienced trauma or, or experiencing it in relation to a client. Um, so I think that's a really good point is like, in some ways, for those of you who are administrators, how can you advocate on a larger mm -hmm. level with right. your agencies to develop a more personalized response when people do experience this kind of trauma? That's a great question. Other question? Hi. Hey, I, um, I think in residential settings, um, staff bring more of their, just more family dynamics come out, even between staff. Um, sometimes it's not even secondary trauma. It might bring up their primary family trauma. And um, I think so, since it's a family dynamic, people get stuck in roles, right? So how do you help staff not always get stuck in their old or 
newly developed roles of like being always the one who's like sticking up for the client or always being the one who's like sticking up for their other staff or always being the one who's trying to make it funny or always being the one who's two hours late after so like how do you help people break out of those trauma roles? Okay, so I'm trying to think of how to finish. So how do we, so the question is, I'm like, this is long, y'all and your long-winded question. Um, all that trauma. Okay, so, so basically, how do, we, how do we recognize patterns in our staff, right, that might not always serve us as, as individuals and as staff, right? Patterns that come from the ways that we engage with each other, patterns that come from our families of origin that we may have carried with us into the room because we all bring that stuff into the work, mm -hmm. into our work life, especially those of us in social services. Um, so how do we actually maybe, so the question might be how do we actually challenge or help staff grow or, or move through some of those roles in a way so that maybe they're not perpetuating. Is that kind of what you mean? Like perpetuating old or problematic? I like the way you put it, it's like a group dynamic, mm -hmm. like where people are stuck in a group dynamic. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how to help a staff move a group, like how to help a staff kind of move from maybe uh, ritualized or even sometimes problematic ways of engaging that might be impacting the ways that they're coping with what's happening in the space. Does that? Get, we got there. We'll word find around that. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know if I can actually answer this question, but we're going to try. So, so part of this conversation today is to acknowledge that we haven't done a good job about the the environments that we work in how they show up in us and then how we show up at the job and then do or do not take care of ourselves this is this is you know profession wide i think to your point is so we we don't have language or processes or best practices in place when we see odd stuff show up at work Right, and odd stuff shows up at work where, you the know, you, you see it. somebody reacting oh, in a way man. that yeah seems more personal and less professional or a different with a different kind of client than with other clients. So, you know, I like to boil things down, like what's happening here, and this is not personal, right? So, if right. I'm speaking to a staff about something that's going on, it's not about personal. This is normal professional development for all of us. It's tricky ground for all of us. I want somebody to say to me, you know, Mary, you seem to have a hard time working with property management. Like, let's talk through what's going on there, as opposed to it just evolving into a big HR problem. I had an interesting situation where a woman also at a debriefing, we have a lot of those, um, very openly in a debriefing, initially say, I can't answer the question, and then went back to it and said, I don't like showing up this way. This is impacting me in a bad way, and it's showing up at home too. And I thought that was very, very courageous mm -hmm. and very interesting because in debriefings, you are supposed to sort of cross over into how it's impacting you personally. So because unlike the, the fallacy that like there's the work-life balance is keeping them totally separate, that will never be the case with any of us, right? Our worlds, our, our, our work life and our, and our career life sort of overlap and hopefully in a healthy way that we feel good about what we do and this is our profession. And yes, we worry about things that impact the world. So how do we use that to guide our supervision of people and say, this is how I see you showing up, and this is what I think I'm seeing, and I only see it with this type of person and under these circumstances. What do you think that's about, or how can I help you rethink that, or how can we talk about working in a different way? It's, it's a little risky, right? Because as Sean alluded to, there's always this, oh, you can't be their therapist, right? But we also have to be clear that we don't want to be afraid of the word trauma. We don't want to be afraid of the word therapy. We don't want to be afraid of, we have to keep our boundaries always guided by what's the best practice for our clients and for what we're doing in our program, but still be able to identify clearly what we're seeing. And it's that, here's what I'm seeing, walk me through what, why you did it that way or why you do it that way. And go from there. You know, people aren't necessarily seeing themselves. But I think it's what we, we get, we either ignore it completely 
and it's showing up blatantly, or we are afraid to approach it. And what we want to say is, this seems to be showing up in a way that it impacts our program or your work. Like, can we talk about it? So sort of not good or bad, not judgmental, mm -hmm. but putting it on the table. Okay. Um, I have a question about the debriefings. Because debriefings are, you know, you have to have safe space and all this yep. stuff. But what happened, have you had experience with having a debriefing where you as a supervisor are finding out egregious and dangerous things, mm -hmm. things that you don't want to keep in the safe space that you feel like you have to intervene about, but if you intervene, you totally breach the confidentiality. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you balance the need for the safe space with the, this is not just a problem with this person, this is a problem that this person is, is bad news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So reconciling cultivating safe spaces with mm -hmm. the reality that safe spaces oftentimes, or not oftentimes, can sometimes bring up some concerning realities about the person that we're debriefing with. And how do we hold them accountable to that while at the same time maintaining this idea of safety? Yes? Yeah, well, yeah exactly. Okay. <laughs> this is like when you have to call ACS on the client you work with, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's, that, it's that, you know, that that thing that you say in therapeutic, like if you're gonna hurt yourself or somebody else, I'm gonna get others involved. Yeah. And you don't say that before a debriefing. I haven't had that situation where, but I have had situations where I've gone back to people in debriefings and said, I'm concerned. But not, not um, sort of an ethical or really unprofessional thing, more I've been worried about their well-being. Um, in, in the debriefing that I spoke about where I felt as an organization, we were obligated to go back and respond to a team that seemed on the edge. I brought that to a higher level, but I've, I haven't had the situation where, yeah, maybe we should call the police. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I, um, I actually, I too haven't had that exact experience. Um, but I do think like in the work that we do um, at CUCS, we have a, a pretty um, well thought out structure and so, I'm, and we go through all of the policies when we when someone starts at our agency. So I think that we would, you know, validate what the person's experience was, and and to say that this is not punitive because you're having a reaction to what happened. This is a different concern based on ethics, based on whatever else right. that I need to address and safety. But to to be very clear and um, you know distinguish between the two. Like you had your experience and that was terrible and I understand that and can validate that. However, you raised something separate from that that I have to address because yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's an ethical issue and I wanna be very clear about it. Do you have questions about that and then move on from there? Um, but just to make sure that everyone knows because that staff member very well could go back to the entire staff and said, because I said blah, blah, blah in the debriefing, they're firing me or they're doing whatever they're doing. But you can only do what you can do when you speak to that individual and be very clear about that. And I, th I think also to that point, you know, safety doesn't imply that people can just say, you know, we often have clients or patients who are like, you know, well, what does confidentiality really mean, right? But <laughs> the reality is, is that like safety is actually about those boundaries. It is about the fact that like, and oftentimes patients, clients, staff will disclose unsafe things because they need the boundary that there will be a reaction, mm -hmm. that there will be right. consequences. It, and, and moving away from that being punitive, but rather that literally that we can serve, that that safe space serves to be a boundary in and of itself. And so if we move away from seeing, uh, breaking, confiden breaking confidentiality, like seeing that as, as then therefore making a space unsafe and rather see it as I'm, I'm honoring your confidentiality and I'm actually honoring what you're sharing with me and I'm going to have a, a, a realistic reaction to what you're saying because I honor what you're actually bringing to me and I take it seriously and I care about you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's shifting that, the way that we define safety, I think, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that there, I see a hand here, but I, this gentleman in the back has been waving for a minute, so you guys are all great projectors. come up about supervision, I really think that supervision is sort of like quasi-therapy, and I think it's really on the agency to sort of set that value, to set that tone. Um, but I also have a recommendation, uh, particularly for the young lady who asked the question about a staff member. Uh, 
Dr. Uh, Charles Egan uh, has his book, it's called Inner Dialogue in Daily Life, uh, which really speaks about self-awareness and self-development, sort of internalizing and reflective practices. So I have a recommendation. Um, and if you have any guys tell you, you can give me email. I promise to send you a copy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I don't, well, maybe you could bring the book up and I could read it out to the, sorry, I, I can't read and say all of that again. <laughs> I'm not going to try. Um, and I saw one question in this corner. Yes. Hi, I wanted to hear if some of the practices that you share with us today have been uh, implemented at an agency level from the top down. It sounded like it's mostly at the program level. And I think that oftentimes we take care as we should of the line staff because they're the ones dealing directly with the clients, but oftentimes we forget about supervisors, mm -hmm. managers, directors, who also experience a uh, different type of trauma by managing these programs, <laughs> burnout, and stress, but don't necessarily have the space or the opportunity to implement uh, self-care strategies uh, for them. And I feel like if managers and directors are not in a good place, then the effectiveness of being able to help our staff is not necessarily there. So I just wanted to know if these are practices that have been implemented from the top down. And if not, do you have any recommendations for us to bring that not only to our programs, but for our agencies? Did everybody hear that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have any? I was having some vicarious trauma over here. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think this is actually kind of what to, to Sean's point that he was speaking to earlier, right, which is the idea of what does it mean for those of us as administrators and managers yeah. to show up and be vulnerable with our staff, right? How do we actually cultivate? And in order to do that, we also have to have spaces for ourselves. And that idea of, again, always, and I love this, you guys are right here with us, shifting from micro to macro. Yep. But how can we actually, in positions of leadership, challenge our agencies to, to develop these policies a, across the board? So that's actually a great question. Do you guys feel, so I know Prince George, you guys have been implementing this at the Prince George. How is that with CUCS as a whole? And the same thing with you guys at the door? Mm. Well, you know, it's, and that's a great question because then I was feeling very, very needy after you said that. <laughs> um, you know, so on a very, very positive note, both executive directors at University Settlement the Door, it's, it's a, sister organization, um, have full heartedly seen to the implementation of these debriefing practices in their agencies, in the programs. But you're absolutely right that at a senior management level, we have not perfected that model. Um, I do have to say that um, we sort of do less, we do some informal debriefing, and I, I'm not as close to the ground as so many people that supervise really intense programs. So I feel slightly maybe more protected, but I think that's really just because I, we don't do it at a high level, and so I'm making excuses. Um, I think it's an excellent, excellent point that we're providing the supervision, and it again speaks to how we haven't operationalized this enough in our programs. I do want to say that I recently did um, like a debriefing process for executive directors. And it was um, shortly after the election when so many leaders of nonprofits were reeling from the potential changes. And it was designed so that they could process like the overwhelming everything, fear having to be the shining star to organizations that were at risk of, of you know, really losing funding. And so that was, um, that was a response to just sort of a settlement house leadership group that I'm a part of. What I found helped my staff, something that I implemented when I went there, because I'm very invested in vicarious trauma, very happy to see it at the forefront of the agenda, because it definitely needs to be talked about. Um, we used to do one of the, every quarter we dedicated a staff meeting to trauma-informed care and then vicarious trauma. 
So I would educate them about vicarious trauma and trauma-informed care. I would give the lecture part of it, the first hour of the staff meeting, and the second hour of it was just dedicated to just do anything that takes you outside of the work. So we would do, um, I have a lot of females, so we would even bring in nail polish and hand creams and free art and art exercises, music, dance, yoga, you know, whatever. Just take yourself out of the work, and we would have a little lunch, and then they would write themselves a commitment letter at the end of it in what was their commitment to their self-care strategy, and I would mail it out to them like three months later when they forgot about it, and then we would talk about it. And it I got very that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Know. That's yeah. great. All right. I, um, one thing I want to say about that is I, I think that that's brilliant. Um, I think that one of the things that we really want to try to be doing for our staff is being creative around interventions around this. We might try something that may not, it may flop, but we want to try and we want to ask our staff like what was helpful. One time what we did was we just colored. Like we had a really, really horrible week where it was just one thing after the next, after the next. And our all staff meetings are on Friday mornings. And so this was a week of hell. And we, I, we just brought in coloring stuff. And we just colored mindlessly with no purpose, yeah. with nothing else to do. And people found that that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And just getting to if, our, if CUCS and Breaking Ground is supportive, they're very supportive. And I think that you know we've evolved over the years. We've been around for about 30 years. Breaking Ground's been around for about the same mm -hmm. amount of time. And we've learned a lot over the years. We've made a lot of mistakes. But I think at the end of the day, like if I can't um, debrief something, our medical director or um, you know lead psychiatrist is going to come in and he's going to debrief for us so that I can be a participant in the debriefing if that's what I need. And I feel very supported by that. I have a supervisor that's unbelievably supportive, and we have a group of directors that gets together every quarter to really just talk about whatever's going on. We sometimes we have topics, sometimes we don't. But just being able to like get with other people who understand what you're going through so that you can talk about it and they can validate it is so helpful. Um, and I think like we'll just keep trying things and sometimes they'll work and sometimes they won't, but we just want to keep talking about it and trying. I just wanted to make a comment that um, lately I've been, be, I've been spending more time like becoming more attuned to how as, a, as an administrator, I'm role modeling. You know, I'm talking, I'm the one that's always talking about make sure you're having lunch, you know, um, you know, how, what are you doing in the morning when you start your day, like how to manage you know, the, the, the ins and outs of dealing with, with folks that just want their their emergency is your emergency kind of situation. And I and I'm you know, I'm trying to work that out with myself, my own inner dialogue about how can I be a champion in, in terms of self care. You know, how am I gonna tell my staff to have lunch but they're seeing me go through the day and not stop. You know what I mean? So really becoming more mindful of what I'm bringing to the table and, and being an example. Um, and even even if it's just for me to to be more attentive to myself so that I can do better work, but also thinking, you know, people are watching me. You know, what am I doing to, to kind of help do that? And and to put my cape away, because I carry a cape. I walk around and I miss it. yes, all the time. But also, that's, that's the role that I've been playing. Folks come to me when they have a problem. They're coming to me when I got a problem, when they have a problem, and I'm like, okay, I'm always putting that pressure on myself to fix it. So today, when I, I mean, I know it, yes. and I hear it, and I was trained that way, but to hear you say it out loud, you know, and I kind of, it, it, it took that pressure off. Like, you know what, listen, we, we, went, we did this together, I'm human, and that vulnerability piece, it, we don't show it as administrative consent. I'm doing a lot more of that. Look, I've, I've been there, or you know, I've, I've had that situation, or you know what, maybe we need to talk about what that looks like moving forward, or how we can do that. Like, I'm always about bringing the team together. Like, I am not the queen of nowhere. I would love to be. <laughs> but I'm not. You know, but, yeah. but just those things that we don't pay attention to. We, we want to help, we want to help, but how are we helping, how are we taking care of ourselves, and how our staff, you know, picking that up. Exactly. exactly. No. And I think that's that's fantastic. And this idea again of 
taking this conversation and thinking critically about it for yourself personally mm -hmm. and then again shifting your focus out so that you're thinking about if this is happening for me as an individual whether I'm a staff member or I'm an administrator I'm a leader then what is this saying about the work that we're doing as an agency what is this saying about how we're engaging with our tenants and what is this what is this creating as far as sustainability right and retention in our communities yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So I just want to let you guys know or let you all know that if if we run out of paperwork, pamphlets, fun handouts in the back, they're going to be posted online on whatever the website is that this <laughs> conference is on. Um, and you'll be able to print it. So it'll be available. I just want to thank you all for being thank here. You. Please, please come up and say hello.